Hi everybody, I'm Ray Wong with Constellation Research and today I have the pleasure to be here with Nicole Lamoureux, the Chief HR Officer of IBM. Hello. Great to be with you, Ray. Hey, this is a very interesting time. We're at a point where AI, automation, human labor are all coming to a close of trying to figure out what's next, where do we go forward, and you're in one of the most dynamic companies going through this change. So let's start with the first question here real quick. What's going on with reskilling? AI, automation, like how are you handling that? And especially given the number of employees, remind everybody how many people you have in the organization. So Ray, this is a great question, because as you say, there's a lot going on in the technology space ar around AI, and people tend to focus on the technology aspect of it, but there is so much to focus on when you think about reskilling, how it's going to impact the workforce. Here at IBM, we have over 250,000 IBMers participating in what we call the AI revolution. They may be building products or helping clients with it, or even the internal staff functions. They're practicing using it. How can it re-engineer their processes? I think the important thing to think about when you think about reskilling on the AI space in general is it's not big bang. It's not gonna just happen overnight. What you've got to think about is how do you give people the opportunity to play with the technology, experiment with the technology, and experience it, and then over time, you're going to see them building skills. No, and it's crazy, right? We were seeing, like, in every business process, in every organization, there are four things going on. When do we do intelligent automation? When do we augment the machine with the human? And that's probably the most important job. Like, like why do you make an exception? Right? Why did you break the rules? Why did you do it differently? Right? And these systems are learning from us. And then, of course, when do you augment the human with the machine so we can make faster decisions? And then every organization is trying to make that important decision. When do you add the human touch? So. I think this is really important. And, you know, again, the technology itself is pretty amazing. But thinking about when and where to use it and when you don't use it, I think are equally important business decisions. Here at IBM, we have some really clear principles about AI in the workforce, AI in the workplace. The first one is, is that AI is meant to augment yes. human intelligence. And I know we've heard this said before, if I could go back in time, I would not call it artificial intelligence. No. I would call it augmented intelligence. And I think that is a key tenet for us here. The second thing that I think is really important principle for us at IBM is when we're using AI in our internal processes, AI is never a decision maker. No. So you have- So human in the loop is key. Human in the loop is really, really key. And I think that's an important part. We also believe that data and insights belong to the creator. So again, this is not about AI running wild. It is also not about us learning from data that could be proprietary or your competitive advantage. And so as we think about those processes, those are some principles that we have that are pretty key here. Now that's really important, right? You've got built-in AI ethics, you've got some really interesting principles about working with machines and automation and AI, and that makes it a very, very safe environment and also a very, very inclusive environment. I think it's really true. And you know, you talked about principles. So we, we talked about some of these core tenets that we have about AI not being a decision maker, but Regardless of where you're using AI, we often think about some other principles you have to have. One is robustness, the robustness mm. of the models. This is what makes them scalable. This is what makes them stand the test of time. As the models are working, are they learning from the right data sets? Yes. Explainability, mm -hmm. transparency, yep. really, really key. Do you know where the data is coming from? Do you know what it's doing? So lineage, veracity. So important. We also think about things like, um, is it fair? So oh. much is talked about in uh, AI around biases and how does that get built in? And so these principles for us are really key as we're using it, as we're experimenting with it, and also building trust with our users that then are at the end of this process. Oh, I really like this mindful approach and I think it's really important uh, that you have a mindful approach. Now, let's talk a little bit about AI tools, right? And how these tools are adding value to the workforce because, you know, there are a lot of times we work on things that are so boring, so monotonous, right? <laughs> you're like, I wish I had something to help me with this. Or sometimes it's really hard to find things and you're wishing like, oh, I wish I had someone to help me find something or give me institutional knowledge and putting that into place. Oh, I'm so glad you asked the question this way because as you know, there's a lot of 
negative, maybe even doomsday perspective out there about AI. Is it gonna take human jobs? What's going to happen? And as I talked about, I believe, and we believe at IBM, that AI is actually gonna be a net job creator for exactly the reason that you talked about. What AI is going to do is it is going to take away the monotonous, the administrative, the rote parts of people's jobs to allow more time for innovation, for creativity, for the things that add business value. So this is about humans having more time to do those things, which is eventually gonna just be very good for business. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and we're definitely seeing the opportunities for people to actually take the time to think and things they wouldn't be able to do before. And, and we also have a lot of cases where we're not finding enough workers, right? Or in countries where population, the population dynamics are shrinking as people age. So a lot of new opportunities being Absolutely. created there. So, so what's needed from enterprises today to ensure that they get the most from this AI and AI experience as we augment intelligence and humanity? The first thing is you have to be prepared to experiment. So you have to be open to try things. There are going to be places where you try to put AI in and it's a huge benefit. There are gonna be places where you try to put AI in and it doesn't make that much of yeah. a difference. So we are in this experimentation phase. But the second piece of this, and that's really important as you balance risk within exper experimentation, is you've gotta have these principles that we've talked about. What are the guardrails? What do you want the AI to do? What don't you want it to do? Particularly for HR leaders, but also for some other lines of business leaders, when we've thought about other technology revolutions, they've been big platform plays. They have been technology that we've put into our processes that mm -hmm. cost several million dollars, <laughs> that might be a two or three year implementation. <laughs> and what's happening now with AI is I think about it a little differently. Rather than kind of buying the whole house, you can experiment in lines of business with small blocks. And you can try one thing at a time. So this start small, see what works, and scale it is one of the power that the AI tools are now giving you. And I think that's also extremely important. No, I love that. Uh, definitely check experimentation. Don't stay in the background, like test it out. Um, don't do it without principles, because that's really important, because you need it as your guardrails. And do it in bite-sized chunks. Yeah, I think it's really important. And, and then again, for line of business leaders, don't forget to get some advocates. Try things in pipelines. Again, AI right now is rarely going to be something that you can just start using enterprise ride right away. You're gonna have to build that momentum. You're gonna have to have the models learn from each yes. other. You're gonna have to make sure that you're putting it at the right pro part of the process. And so as you're doing that experimentation, build advocates along the journey with you get feedback from your users about what is really unlocking value or not, and then scale. So how is AI then changing the enterprise in general? Oh. From my perspective, and I think this is true for a lot, lot of line of business owners, there are really three things that are hitting us, particularly in the HR department. One is we're being asked to make sure that we're making optimal investments. For every dollar that you spend, are you getting the best return? Yep. The second thing that's happening is the environment that we're operating in is getting more and more complex. So you can see how those first two things are actually in conflict yeah. with one another. And then finally in the workplace, employees are expecting consumer grade, customizable, personalized exper experiences. So all three of these things are hitting us here in the workplace. And just as you said, AI is our ability to unlock all of that. How are we going to make sure that we are using human talent where yep. human talent is needed the most? That's how you're optimizing. AI is also allowing human talent to deal with very complex situations by giving you information that you need real time. And the automation that you talked about is exactly what is giving our employees those customizable experiences. Well, then that means the HR function is changing as well because of AI. What are you doing in that area? <laughs> We're doing a lot in this area. And, you know, just, just a couple examples as we think about it. As we are servicing our employees and managers, typically we would have done this in very traditional ways. We would have assigned maybe HR business partners yep. to certain managers to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Or for our employees, we would have had call center support yeah. that they would have to engage in with. 
And what we were hearing from our employees and managers is, is there an ability for us to get 24 by 7 mm -hmm. support? Oh, yeah. Again, it's hard to have And humans. you're a global company. Yes, exactly. So 24 7 is 24 7. It is really 24 7. So, how do you get that around the clock service? The other thing that we were hearing from managers and employees were things like, there are some questions that I actually don't need a human to answer. That, you know, just very quick, what's the vacation policy? Yep. Can I take vacation? Very quick, easy answers. They don't necessarily need a human to answer that. But there are times when they needed an HR professional. I'm about to go out on maternity leave. Is everything all set? Oh, yeah. I'd like to move to a new job. Can somebody advise me on what to do? Yep. Those types of questions required human support. But what was happening in our organization was the very basic questions were taking a lot of time of humans that they couldn't get to the higher order questions. And so we put in an AI chatbot using Watson Assistant. Of course. Watson X, of course. Watson X. <laughs> and uh, that is now the first part of the interactions with all employees and managers. So that means all the people that, was, that were answering those questions, the same monotonous road questions, people are waiting for that, they're now being serviced, and now they're elevated to the next level of support. Right? Absolutely. And so here's the way I would describe it. A couple things happened as we did this. So first of all, that Ask HR digital layer, the AI-enabled assistant, is handling 1.5 million conversations a year. Which you probably couldn't have done with the contact centers like that before. No way, yeah. and it's real time. They're not waiting in the and queue, no wait. <laughs> right? So they're getting that information real time. The NPS for our digital layer has gone up to plus 35. Ooh, that's really high. It is very high, and in some processes, it's as high as plus 70. Wow. And it's because they can get that information real time. But as you said, they're also getting to the experts faster. So that digital layer is now routing them to the tier two human tier when they do have one of those questions that we want handled by a human. Uh, to put this in context for those listening here, like that's a really high net promoter score. <laughs> like really, really high, especially and in HR, that is really high. So yeah, absolutely. And this is a journey that we've been on for, for a couple years. But it's not just about managers and employees. For the profession itself, we've also seen a ton of value. As you said, dealing with a net promoter score, plus 35 or plus 70, is a pretty good work environment to be in. But the other thing that we're seeing is that for a lot of these processes, the average level of an HR professional has gone one full grade or band in our world. So they are doing that higher value work. Um, that is bringing kind of more career progression for them. Fun HR joke. I guess we're moving the nine box a little bit differently now. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So no, this is great. So that means all this stuff is coming in place. So how should other CHROs change their approach given that there's all this technology innovation in front of them and AI is playing one of those parts of the role. The culture is also something that you're talking about here. And more importantly as well, ch changing the way people work. I think about kind of two key entry points if I think about the HR function. One is this digital assistant. I think it can add a ton of value in an organization for basic Q&A, basic transactions, basic queries, and it might be how you then want to tier your support model. A second area of entry, if you think that's not for you, is actually around automation, which you referenced before. Every HR process has a lot of processes that underpin the day-to-day -day talent life cycle. Yeah. Whether it's payroll or talent acquisition or benefits or careers or compensation. And so thinking where you might want to input to get better leverage some forms of automation. One thing that we hear from HR professionals a lot is that as they run talent cycles, maybe it's a promotion cycle, they have to take data from a lot of different sources to yeah. make sure that we're making the best decisions. It's a great place to start with automation, where automated, intelligent automation can actually bring in data from different sources and surface it up to HR professionals and managers. And you're right, for every organization or even industry, it's gonna be different, right? That hire to retire to boomerang cycle is gonna play a different play. Absolutely. 
We recently put in Watson Orchestrate, our automation tool, into a promotion process here at IBM. And in one promotion process that typically would have taken about one quarter, we saved 12,000 hours just wow. by some very simple automation. Now, can we do that with space optimization when you move offices? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. That could be yeah, another could be use one. case. So. We can write the check and we'll see what we can do. No, that's very, very cool. Well, hey, this has been a wonderful discussion with you. We're looking at the intersection of all these AI advancements, automation, but remember, it's all about being human and really building that around the culture. People have to be comfortable with it. You have to think about this with humans first, a good ethical approach in terms of your AI design, but more importantly, don't be afraid. Get started, right? Absolutely, just get started. Nicole, thank you very much.